100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The Magnificent Family Chronicle, one of the most acclaimed novels of our time, forces upon us at every page the wonder and extravagance of life, says New York Review of Books. There's the cover. Page 249. Not today, he told the barber. We'll make it on Friday. He had a three-day beard speckled with white hairs, but he did not think it necessary to shave. Because on Friday, he was going to have to have his hair cut. And it could all be done at the same time. The sticky sweat of the unwanted siesta aroused the scars of the sores in his armpits. The sky had cleared, but the sun had not come out. Colonel Air, let's see, Aureliano, Aureliano Buendia released a sonorous belch which brought back the acidity of the soup to his palate, and which was like a command from his organism to throw his blanket over his shoulders and go to the toilet. He stayed there longer than was necessary, crouched over the dense fermentation that was coming out of the wooden box until habit told him that it was. Time to start work again and turn. During the day he lingered. He remembered that it was Tuesday and that Jose Arcadio Segundo had not come to the workshop because it was payday on the Banana Company Farms. That recollection, as all those of the past few years, led him to think about the war without his realizing it. He remembered that Colonel Gerineldo Marquez had once promised to get him a horse with a white star on its face and that he had never spoken about it again. Then he went on toward scattered episodes, but he brought them back without any judgment because since he could not think about anything else, he had learned to think coldly so that inescapable memories would not touch any feeling on his way back to the workshop. Seeing that the air was beginning to dry out, he decided that it was a good time to take a bath, but... Amaranta, Amaranta had got there ahead of him, so he started on the second little fish of the day. He was putting a hook on the tail when the sun came out with such strength that the light creaked like a fishing boat. The air, which had been washed by the three-day drizzle, was filled with flying ants. Then he came to the realization that he felt like urinating, and he had been putting it off until he had Finished fixing the little fish, he went out into the courtyard at ten minutes after four when he heard the distant brass uh, distant brass instruments, the beating of the brass drum, and the shouting of the children. And for the first time since his youth, he knowingly fell into a trap of nostalgia and relived that prodigious afternoon of the gypsies when his father took him to see the Santa Sofia de la Piedad dropped what she was doing in the kitchen and ran to the door. It's the circus, she shouted. It's the circus. Where is this going? Do we want to find out? If you want to find out, then you have to go buy the book and then read 200-something pages and eventually page 179. I go Tuesday nights, he confessed. If you promise not to tell anyone, I'll take you next Tuesday. Indeed. On the following Tuesday, Petronio came down out of the tower with a wooden stool, which until then no one had known the use of, and he took Jose Arcadio Segundo to a nearby pasture. The boy became so taken with those nocturnal raids that it became a long time before he was seen as Caterinos. Caterinos. He became a cock-fighting man. Take those creatures somewhere else, Ursula ordered him the first time. She saw him come in with his fine fighting birds. Roosters have already brought too much bitterness to the, this house for you to bring us any more. Jose Arcadio Segundo took them away without any argument, but he continued breeding them at the house of Pillar to Nera, his grandmother, who gave him everything he needed in exchange for having him in her house. He soon displayed in the cockpit the wisdom that Father Antonio Isabel had given him, and he made enough mon money not only to enrich his brood, 
but also to look for a man's satisfactions. Ursula compared him with his brother that at that time and could not understand how the twins who looked like the same person in childhood had ended up so differently. Her perplexity did not last very long for quite soon. Aureliano Segundo began to show signs of laziness and dissipation while he was shut up in Mel Quian. Quiande's room, he was drawn into himself the way Colonel Aureli, Aureliano Buendia had been in his youth, but a short time after the Treaty of Nirlandia, a piece of chance took him out of his withdrawn self and made him face the reality of the world. The young woman who was selling numbers for the raffle of an accordion greeted him with a great deal of familiarity. Aureliano Segunda was not surprised, for he was frequently confused with his brother. But he did not clear up the mistake, not even when the girl tried to soften his heart with sobs, and she ended taking him to her room. She liked him so much, she so much from that first meeting that she fixed things so that he would win the accordion accordion in the raffle at the end of two weeks Ari Ari Liano Segundo realized that the woman who had been going to bed alternatively with him and his brother thinking that they were the same man instead of making things clear he arranged to prolong the situation he did not return to Mel Cuyati's room he would spend his afternoons in the courtyard learning to play the accordion by ear over the protest of Ursula who at that time had forbidden music in the house because of the morning, and who in addition despised the accordion as an instrument worthy only of the vagabond heirs of Francisco, the man nevertheless, Aureliano Segunda, became a virtuoso on the accordion, and he was uh, he still was after he had married and had children and was one of the most respected men in Macondo. page 69. He repeated it so many times and with such conviction that one afternoon when he was putting together a little gold fish in the workshop, he had the certainty that she had answered his call. Indeed, a short time later, he heard the childish voice. When he looked up, his heart froze with terror as he saw the girl at the door dressed in pink organdy and wearing white boots. You can't go in there, Remedios Amparo Muscote. Moscote said from the hall, they're working, but Aureliano did not give her time to respond. He picked up the little fish by the chain that came through its mouth and said to her, come in, Remedios. <clears throat> Went over and asked some questions about the fish that Aureliano could not answer because he was seized with the sudden attack of asthma. He wanted to stay beside that lily skin forever, beside those emerald eyes close to that voice that called him sir. With every question so showing the same respect as she gave her father, Mel Quiades was in the corner seated at the desk, scribbling indecipherable signs. Or Reliano hated him. All he could do was tell Remedios that he was going to give her the little fish, and the girl was so startled by the offer that she left the workshop as fast as she could. That afternoon, Aureliano lost the hitting patience, lost the hidden patience with which he had waited for a chance to see her. He neglected his work and several desperate efforts of concentration. He willed her to appear, but Remedios did not respond. He looked for her in her sister's shop behind the window shades in her house in her father's office, but he found her only in the image that saturated his private and terrible solitude, he would spend whole hours with Rebecca in the parlor listening to the music on the pianola. She was listening to it because it was the music with which Pietro Crespi had taught them how to dance. Aureliano listened to it because simply because everything, even music, reminded him of Remedios. The house became full of love. Aureliano expressed it in poetry that had no beginning or end. He would write it on the harsh pieces of parchment that Mel Quayades gave him on the bathroom walls, on the skin of his arms, and on all of it. Remedios would appear transfigured. Remedios in the 
So porrific air of two in the afternoon, remedios in the soft breath of the roses, remedios in the water clock secrets of the moss, remedios, remedios, remedios. So I'm not terribly excited about this book. I mean, I heard he wrote the book and then he handed it to his wife and was like, there, pay the bills. You know, it's four dollars. Right. And it was like, um. I think when I think about Latin America and South America, the book that I really, really want to get into is Open Veins, Open Veins of Latin America. That's the book that I feel like um, I do like biographies. I can't um, believe it. I'm re, you know, all these assholes that were such dickheads about literature. And I think I like reading, but then I'm like, am I just being brainwashed? So I'm really just kind of going through all my different books I like. Some, you know, books just uh, capture me and get a hold of me and I, you know, can't, uh, it's a page turner. I can't let go of it until, you know, the end of it. And so those, um, those are the books that we need to see more of and less of these crappy, stupid novella books. It's almost like I'm reading um, a script or a screenplay to a movie. I w wish that... You know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez would have turned it into a screenplay and put it on the big screen so that way I can kind of get a fucking, you know, idea of what the hell this goddamn book is even about. I don't, a guy's over here and then a guy's over there. I don't, but I tried to start, this all began with the Dushesky, so, you know, he's impossible to fucking read and if you don't have a billion goddamn years, don't fucking read him. I mean, he's a fucking dick <laughs> so there you go um yeah this might be a good book but i'm not uh you know too persuaded you got to read three pages with me perhaps i'll you know read some more and uh change my mind but for right now i am not captivated by 100 years of solitude not yet at least